ultimately your final essay is going to deal primarily with uh, Anu Partman's Finland School Success. And you'll be examining and arguing uh, whether or not you think the U.S. should adopt certain elements of the Finnish education system that have been touted as being very successful. But before we get into that essay, I think it's useful to read uh, this one by Jonathan Kozel, Fremont High School, which takes a look at a high school in Fremont, California, that is definitely far in a way quite different uh, than the kind of Finnish school system that Anu Partinen discusses. Because I think it's interesting to set up a contrast. Certainly not all American schools are like Fremont. You may have gone to a wonderful high school or elementary school or what have you. But we do see a sharp discrepancy here that there are some poorly funded and run public schools in America versus in Finland where there are no private schools, uh, they do their best to treat every public school equally. And so I think that having that basis of contrast might be something worth considering for your paper. So Jonathan Kozel, just to give a little bit of background information on him, because I think he's a really interesting figure, he has for a long time been a writer, an educator, and an activist when it comes to educational issues. So he's written a lot of books, done research, he's gone to public schools and interviewed students and teachers, and like this essay, is something of an investigative reporter who wants to get the story out there that maybe if you haven't gone to a school like Fremont High School, you wouldn't know about. Now, what I do find, I think, just really interesting about him is that he was a grad uh, an Harvard uh, undergrad student, Oxford graduate student, planned to teach English at Harvard after studying in Paris. So, you know, this really educated man who decided to take a very different career path. So when he had come back to the U.S. after studying in Paris, it was during the civil rights movement, and he had heard about the death of three civil rights activists, uh, two white and one black, and was just so struck by the enormity of their fight that he was inspired to particularly fight for inner city schools that were often poorly funded and noted by racial division and unequal learning conditions. So that became his life's work. And we can see a sample of that in his article, Fremont High School, which actually comes from a larger book called The Shame of the Nation, The Restoration of Apartheid Schooling in America. So he's very interested in uh, the class and race discrepancies in education and funding and teachers and how some people get the short end of the stick simply because where they're born. And so part of that um, interest you can definitely see in his article. We would call Fremont High School more of a report perhaps than an argument. And the purpose of a report is generally to inform readers about a topic, not necessarily to convince them of a particular position, but necessarily if you're writing a report, you probably have a stake in the topic. And some reports do become persuasive reports in which the information that is highlighted is clearly meant to uh, point you towards um, a particular issue that you might take a stance on. So the ways in which a report might be different from an argument is that while they're still research based, they're often a bit more neutral. They leave out more of the author's opinions and just kind of give you the facts, give you the interviews, give you the observations. But again, not always, you can still bring in the author's uh, perspective as well. So reports seldom rely on just one source of info. We even saw this in Dana Boyd's article where she was interviewing students and trying to report on an issue, but she was definitely making an argument as well. So we see Kozel in his book uh, talking to multiple students and teachers, multiple schools. It just happens that we're reading specifically about Fremont High School. So the nature of what a writer chooses to report on 
can certainly, you know, set us up with evidence to develop an opinion, a position on a topic. So when you're reading a report, you might find yourself inspired to say, wow, this situation is terrible. And you could then take that data, that evidence, and create your own persuasive argument to say, let's do something so that no school is like Fremont High School. And then part of your evidence and your argument would be citing Kozel's Fremont High School. So he provides us with a lot of information that could potentially be useful in crafting an argument, especially if you were to say there should be no schools like Fremont High School and maybe adopting at a national level the kinds of standards as the Finnish education system, maybe that would be an improvement. Or maybe not. That's something that we'll get into. So when you read Kozel's Fremont High School, I would ask you, what sense do you get of Kozel's own opinion? Does he approve of the way that Fremont High School is run? Does he sympathize with students, with teachers, with administrators? Can you sense his position? I think you can, um, even if he doesn't come out and express his emotions quite often. Because of what he focuses on, we see what he thinks is a problem. Now to take a report and turn it into a more clear-cut persuasive argument, we can just make a few changes. And if we were in class together right now, I would normally do this as an activity. I would give you all a paragraph or a quotation from the article that is an example of a report of information without opinion really added to it. And I would ask you to write a couple of more sentences in order to add the persuasive element to say, here's the info, and here, dear reader, is what I want you to do with it, what I want you to think about. And that would be a good exercise in going from evidence and info to argument, position. Here's what I want my reader to feel or think or do. And that's something I'll show you an example of here. But when you write your position paper, that would be something you would think about. I read this in Kozel's article, or I read this in Partnan's article. Here is my position on if it would be good for American schools. Let me explain why in order to convince my reader. So we take the information that these authors give us, and then we try to do something with it. So if you take a look here in black, I have uh, Kozel's actual words. And then in green, I added a statement from me that basically interprets that information for my reader and takes a firm position on what I think about that information. So if we take a look here, Kozel says he reports on the conditions at Fremont High School, and he says hairdressing and sewing, it turned out, were not the only classes students at the school were taking that appeared to have no relevance to academic education. And now remember, these students were often forced to take courses like hairdressing and sewing, not because they wanted to, which would be fine, but their options were limited. And he discusses that elsewhere in the reading. But to go back to the quote, a number of the students, for example, said that they were taking what were known as service classes, in which they would sit in on an academic class but didn't read the text or do the lessons or participate in class activities, but passed out books and did small errands for the teachers. They were given half credits for these courses. All right, so that's the information Kozel gives me. He doesn't tell me what he thinks about it. He doesn't tell me what to think about it. But if I'm a careful reader, if I'm a thoughtful reader, if I'm a human being, I'm going to develop an opinion on it my opinion happens to be what I put in green. Yours could be different. So adding my opinion to the data develops an argument. So I interpreted that information to mean this. The administration behind these decisions is taking advantage of low income and minority students, using them for free labor at the expense of a real education. Right, so there I am making a firm statement that I think the administration that's making these students do this stuff is wrong. 
right? And that they are exploiting students and that those students are losing out on a real education as a result. So that would be my argument that I would build perhaps into a larger paper. We can take a look at one more example here. Again, the black is um, COSL's actual reportage and the green is me interpreting that, staking a position on it and making an argument. So COSL told us that students received credits too for jobs they took outside of school in fast food restaurants, for instance, I was told. How, I wondered, was a credit earned or a grade determined for a job like this outside of school? Best behavior and great customer service, said a student who was working in a restaurant as she explained the logic of it all to ACLU lawyers in her deposition. So actually, if you do a little bit more background research, um, these students brought a lawsuit with the backing of the ACLU uh, to sue their school for what they felt was unequal treatment that harmed their educational opportunities. So it's one thing to have a job outside of school. Many people do, many people need it, but to be given credit for it and not allowed to take other real courses instead, that was the issue that a lot of students had, that they weren't given choices. If they had made this choice for themselves, that would have been very different. So here's where I add what you can tell is my pretty firm opinion, because that's the point of an argument. You have a position on an issue. You must back it up with evidence, which in this case is Kozel's reporting, and then you provide your opinion and try to convince your reader of it. So what I would add is, and I'm speaking about that student who was quoted earlier, uh, she confirms what Fortino, another student, uh, quoted earlier, the school thinks they're ghetto, so they must work in factories, fast food, and other such industries. Fremont High School is cruelly setting students up for failure, even as they desperately want more from their education. But how are students to set goals and high expectations for themselves when they're treated this way before they even reach adulthood? And so you can see that I'm employing some pathos here. I would say me quoting Kozel would be an example of logo, so I'm providing you evidence. But then in order to convince you of what that evidence should mean, then I use words like cruelly, desperate, failure, um, and I ask a question to try to make my reader think about what I'm saying. And that would be part of what you would consider when you make an argument. What are your reasons for what you are arguing and how will you try to make your viewpoints stand out and convince your reader? That'll be something that you think about in your position paper.